Welcome back to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio. And this week, I'm joined by the hitman Nathan Johnson, who's here to speak to me all about the five phases of an ideal transformation journey, which are phase one, clean the palate, phase two, the process, phase three, consolidation, phase four, investment, and phase five, reward. We dive deep into each of these phases separately and uncover the lifestyle solutions that can help you maximize each one. But where we spend most of our time and go real deep into is the consolidation phase. And we talk about the dangers that many of you will face here and how you need to be prepared for it ahead of time in order to consolidate your gains properly. I know we discuss this phase a lot, but given our experiences personally of spending years messing it, messing it up, it's now our duty to make sure you don't go through the same. And I really hope you enjoy this one and take a lot of value from it. Cool. So today, um, me and Nathan thought we'd get together and discuss uh, the real journey that someone goes through uh, when it comes to um, starting a transformation and really highlighting the point that this is a journey and there is no real end point and it, it all works through different phases. And what we're going to do in today's podcast is going to do a deep dive into each of the phases that we think makes up uh, the ideal client journey and really go into it deep and talk about the the various tools and tricks that we use on each phase uh, to help uh, guide you along towards your goals. So we're going to kick it off uh, firstly by overviewing the whole the whole process and then we're going to do uh, I'm going to go into each one separately. So do you want to kick it off by talking about the five step process uh, that we like to use uh, and then we'll go into the first one. Yeah, so um as, as I just mentioned, we've got five uh, spots. We've got the um, cleansing of the palate phase, the the process phase, the consolidation phase, the investment phase, and the reward phase. And all of them uh, are, um, let's say, uh, maneuverable around each other, but they all come in in a sequence for an exact reason. You know, uh, we find that without a, a good a cleansing of the palate phase, you can't be as good in the process phase. And without a consolidation phase, you can't have a good investment phase or a reward phase. So, you know, they, they do go on top of each other and, and they build upon each other, um, but they are interchangeable as well. Um, some people will start in different phases and some people will, you know, need to go through the whole phase. Um, it will just totally depend on the individual in, in their timing and, and how long they've dieted for previously or their experience around training and nutrition. Yeah. I mean, in episode 61, we discussed the, the clean the palate phase and how it's all about regaining control. So we'll, we'll go into it again uh, and maybe go a little bit deeper into it. And then, and then we'll go into the, the process, uh, consolidation, investment and, and reward. So let's kick it off with clean the palate. Uh, I'll let you go first. You can talk about the clean the palate and then I can add my two cents on it. Cool. So effectively, this phase is when we regain total control of your habits, structures and systems that you have in place uh, that is geared towards the specific outcome that you want, whether it is you know, losing 10 kilos, doing a photo shoot, feeling better in yourself or whatever, whatever your current goal is at this moment in time. You will use this phase to kind of build some habits um, and formulate things that you're, you're, uh, you're transitioning from, you know, less optimal to, to kind of giving yourself towards a giving yourself a best shot at that, whether it is, you know, learning how to cook meals and batch cooking, or it's like how, um, how to make non-negotiables within your day to, to make sure you get your training in or, or your, or your nutrition or your, um, your certain step target, you know, all of these different things that will, <clears throat> will have an impact on, you know, the processes going forward. You kind of need to kind of systemize and structure, uh, from the beginning. Um, you know, most of it is going to be around making non-negotiables with your time, looking to make making changes to your routines, and uh, and removing decision fatigue from the uh, from the structure. So, you know, a lot of people will start a new plan and have a lot of questions based on preconceived ideas of what they think is right or what they've been told previously. And uh, this phase is about making sure that you know it, everyone is batting off the same hymn sheet and ensuring that we are uh, making towards uh, we are going towards the uh, the end goal. Exactly. And this is also the period where, you know, you mentioned that coming out of the decisions and a lot of people get thrown off or intimidated by the idea that they can't make any more decisions. <laughs> and they say, oh, well, I have to eat the same thing every day for, for a week or I have to eat the same thing every day for two weeks. Why is that so important in this phase? And why is it only a short period that you need to go through? 
I think ultimately there's before before starting something new, um, you don't have any buy into nothing. You don't, you know, you have no set way of doing things. You know, whether it is a rigid meal plan or it's a set something. Um, you are now accountable to something. You are accountable to a to a meal plan. You are accountable to 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 some variables. You know the, the rigid meal plan offers you so many different things. Uh, and, and at the beginning, you know whether it is seven to fourteen days, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, if it's part of a process, it shouldn't be you know focused on to to being a negative. You know if you know that after fourteen days, after seven days, you're going to be eating more variety, then you know you kind of go through that process with the with the end goal in sight. The fourteen days or the seventeen the seven days will give you, you know a clear goal, a clear, concise structure to kind of mimic, you know, a lot of people will not have the optimal setup or not have, um, the same amount of nutrition as knowledge as their coach or, uh, a significant amount of understanding about how they should structure things. So being able to take someone else's idea and use it as a template to, to, to put on their life to then start the juices flowing within their own life would then allow them to kind of move forward into the other phases. And when you enter these new phases and you have a chance to add more variety into your plan, if you've got that foundational structure in place from phase one, then it's a lot easier to do it without completely going off the rails. Because what we find is when people add variety in too early or they start on a very flexible plan, if they don't have that foundation in place already, is it becomes very difficult to stay in line with your goals and becomes a lot easier to veer off track when the opportunity may arise. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and a lot of people will fall victim to apps like MyFitnessPal, fall victim to guesstimating when they don't actually know how, how much things are. They will fall victim to you know fads and, and different methods um, dur- during that pay- phase if they don't have like some sort of rigidity and structure. Exactly. Now, the question I've got for, for you, uh, and I've got my own thoughts on this, is did the clean the palate phase only come at the beginning? Or is this something that can be used uh, throughout the journey? I know. So, like, I, I, I truly believe that there's probably three occasions where uh, the clean of the palate should be used. And um, one is at the beginning to kind of reset and regain control. Number two, it's an abridged version, but it's definitely a, it's the most, it's the linchpin out of everything. It's during the consolidation phase. Uh, and effectively, it's your it's your Steven Gerrard of, of of Liverpool. It's the midfield. It's the it's the linchpin of the team. And for you ladies out there, the, you know, um, the consolidation phase is like your foundation of your makeup. You know, without this layer, you can't do anything else on top, um, or you, it doesn't it doesn't look as good. And what I mean by that is that during this consolidation phase, you you are fighting and you finished your goal. You know, you've had. You've got great fat loss. You, you've achieved your goal. You've done a photo shoot and, and the leash is finished. You know, you, you've achieved your goal. However, at that point in time, having more flexibility and having more variety will lead you down the path that you, of, of uncontrolled eating, of, of potential binge, binging patterns and ultimately over-consuming of food. Um, you know, your body is wired at that point in time during that end point, you know, the end of a diet, you effectively have been restricting food and restricting energy for a long period of time. So when you are completely unleashed, you know, you will feel the need to over overeat and your hunger signaling will be significantly higher as well. So then you won't actually, you'll always over consume effectively. And, during, and without a consolidation phase and without the cleansing of the palate during that phase, so like an intertwined version, um, you run the risk of not being able to do an investment phase or a muscle building phase because you've regained all of the weight that you've, you've kind of, you kind of dieted off. You know, you'll see a lot of people that they, they do their 12 weeks and they, and they leave and then they are 10 kilos heavier in, in four to five weeks time. And that's solely because they haven't done a consolidation phase or a cleansing of the palate afterwards. You know, they ha- they, they've just gone off the rails. They haven't controlled um, the variables that are at play. Yeah. So that's, so we've got the, we've got the beginning of phase one, which is the first time you use it. There's the period just after you finish your first diet or your fat loss phase and, and you need to regain control or at least get a fi- firm grasp of everything um, leading into that consolidation phase. 
And then I'd add one more, one more time. And that would be, uh, during a long kind of long muscle building phase, uh, where, you know, you, you start spilling over your calories too often. You start taking a piss with your bulk and you start thinking, Oh, I can just eat more food, more food. You start getting a bit too flexible, but you know, I'm all for an 80, 20 flexible lifestyle when, you know, in, in lifestyle phases or in muscle building phases, but when it gets to like 50, 50 or like 60, 40, or when you start overdoing it with the, with the junk food and you, and you keep spilling over your diet, I think a short, sharp, clean the palate phase can really help regain the uh, structure, control, discipline, and the routines that carried you so well through the first three phases. Yeah, absolutely. 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 It's otherwise known as a mini cut. You know, it's almost like when you, when you put in that two week mini cut, or a three week, whatever, the, whatever the, the length is, but it's just a two to three week period where you just say, okay, I'm just going to regain control of everything I'm doing, reinstill the habits, get the structure back into place and, uh, essentially run another clean the palate, uh, period. And this can help then set you up for another lengthy, uh, bulking phase. Absolutely. The reset button. Exactly. Okay. So we've, we've dialed in at the first few weeks of, of cleaning the palate. Uh, and now we're shifting gears into phase two, which is the process phase. Now, talk us through this. Effectively, the process phase is, is exactly what it says on the tin. Um, you're focusing on the process. Um, and, and, and this is what we, we've spoke about this before, where you have like goal-driven individuals and you have process individuals. And those that have the goal-driven goal, um, individuals, they become a lot easier to knock off course because if something isn't going towards their goal, then they are going a million miles in the opposite direction. Um, and you know, whether it's, they, they chase optimal, but actually, you know, they, when they don't get optimal, they don't do nothing at all. And then that's going to be negative towards their, their whole, the whole process, because you will never get a hundred percent. You will never get optimal in a 12 week thing. You know, three months is a very long time for the, for things to go wrong. And, you know, we, we see it all of the time. There, there's at least one family issue or one wedding or one issue during the time frame of a three month, you know, whether it is, you know, a, a, a wedding season or a friend's birthday or a stag do that you've agreed to go on or, or a meal out that requires you to drink 10, 10 beers or whatever it is. Um, there will always be something. So, you know, going and changing your, your, your focus towards the process and the day-to-day basis will allow you to kind of do this for a long period of time and know that you're totally in control. And we'll, we'll talk about control uh, when we get into the consolidation phase again. But ultimately, the process phase is about you understanding that you're totally responsible and totally in control of everything that happens, you know, whether it is towards fat loss or towards muscle building or whatever your goal, you are totally responsible. Um, over this period of time, you will get given or be allowed to, you know, have variety with foods um, and, and test the waters when it comes to different food sources, different recipes. And, and, and like that is your, that is your, your process. Your process will be to kind of tick your boxes on your steps to do what's needed on a day-to-day basis with your diet, AKA, you know, following it or, or finding a strategy or solution for a social event or a, or a, or a, or a, um, a wedding or whatever the, the kind of off plan meal is. And then you're just focusing on those processes on a day-to-day basis. You're almost ticking it off the fridge like a checklist, and then you're repeating that on a day-to-day basis. And that's effectively the process phase. You know, your day-to-day actions will lead to the end result. You don't need to focus on the end result, providing that you've got someone in your corner to uh, push you in that direction. Direction. Yeah, and for most people, the process phase is more geared towards fat loss. And I liken it towards the period of, of getting to that first goal, which is usually fat loss related. So for most people who are coming for a fat loss transformation, this would be the period where you know, you're ticking the boxes on a daily basis and you're, you know, you're grinding towards that goal. And I think there's different periods of the process phase and you get the, you get the gathered momentum phase, which is like in the middle where everything just starts coming together. You just, actually, I should probably rewind first. Firstly, at the beginning of the process phase is where, you know, you're like week three to week five, you're still really motivated. The, the, weight's, flo- the weight's falling off, you're getting leaner. And then you get into the dip. Oh, I hate you know, the, the dip. Period, yeah, the dip, which is <laughs> the period where nothing looks good. You think you're making progress, but you can't really see it in the mirror. You can't see it in your measurements. The things are slowly starting to tick away, but you don't really know what the end goal is. And it's kind of that no man's land period where no one really likes to be in. 
But if you can push through the dip and come out the other side, that's where all the results are. And that's where you get through that gathered momentum. And, and it's something I like to call where, you know, you spent, you spent months ticking the boxes and all of a sudden your body's like in a flywheel motion and it just starts, the body fat just starts flying off. The, the strength starts going through the roof. Everything just starts working really well. And then once this is in place, this is typically when we'll do, uh, you know, we'll, I, I call it pull the pin or, you know, as, I, as I've coined it, Vigella grind. And this is where we really go aggressive because you've, you've built all that momentum. You've solidified your habits and routines. And now you can do something really aggressive in order to really push, push through and, and blast off those final bits of fat loss uh, to reach your initial goal. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, those phases happen in every single body. Let's just, we'll make it clear to the listeners that, you know, these three phases that people go through, it's not an opinion. It, it literally happens with every single client. And it's, it's a psychological, um, you know, these are psychological feelings that you go through and, and that's a, a process within itself. You know, I want to just come back to the, the, uh, the dip and it's a, it's a personal bugbear of mine is that obviously you've got two parts of the dip. You've got that dip that you're talking about, which is the, you know, you're not seeing any results or that you, you're working really, really hard, but there's very minimal output on the metrics. Um, but you yeah. know, things are going in the right direction, but maybe not to your expectations. And then you've got the dip that happens when people get, uh, quite a lot of results over a short period of time. And then they start to, ease off on their aggressiveness and their intensity towards their goals. And we get this quite often. And it's those overachievers, those ones that have done really well in the first six weeks, they have that dip between week seven and week 10 where they've done really well with themselves and they start self-justifying uh, and self-sabotaging their food, like uh, whether it is having a meal out here, there, and everywhere, or you know they they've resisted for seven weeks of saying no to a certain food, but then they've looked in the mirror today, they've dropped another kilo and a half. They're like, oh well, you know, I'm up, I, I, I'm in a negative, I'm doing really well. I'm going to actually say yes to this, or they say it in a in a in a uh, in a very um, what's the word? What you say? very random fashion where they're like oh yeah okay i'll have that yeah it's fine um and then and then they start the self-justification mode which is 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 really hard to get out of you know once you've said you know yes to your feelings and and and, and crumbled you know that that resolve that resolute that you you built through the um cleansing of the palate phase is gone and uh, it's very hard to get back yeah it's the precision dish it is so precise and then suddenly you start guesstimating, which we'll come on to next is, you know, the guesstimating begins and it's, oh, I'll have a bit of that. I'll have a bit of this, or I don't need to weigh it. That looks like 200 grams of chicken breast, but it's probably 400 or whatever. You know, I'm making an exaggeration there, but that's when all the, the guesstimation begins and oh, I don't need to take the scales out today. I'm, I think I'm leaner. You know, it's <laughs> all of that begins. Uh, so the guesstimation phase is something that happens in, in this period. And it's when, people completely overestimate or underestimate how many calories they're consuming when they're eating out or when they decide to, to wing it at home. Yeah. Let's... This is a real trick because people think, uh, they'll say to you, oh, I'm doing everything right. I'm ticking all the boxes. I've stuck to the meal plan. I was out and I just thought I'd, do, I'd pick something really similar. So I'm on it with my calories. And then they look in, they check in and they're exactly the same weight or they're 0. 0.2 up or 0. 0.2 down. That is very minimal. And they wonder what's going on. And the reality is, they've just blown their calories or they've just taken themselves out of a deficit without realizing it because there's so many sneaky calories that gets that come into uh, when you're eating out or even at home. I mean, for example, today I had a check-in which uh, the, the guy said uh, I had a bit of sauce uh, on my eggs. I had a, um, a few berries and I had, um, uh, there's one other thing. And then he said, I said, I said, what did he, what did they come out to calorie, calorie wise? And he said, I calculate to about an extra 219 calories a day. And that's 1400 calories across the week. And now you might have just reduced your deficit quite significantly. And you probably won't, probably won't have get the, Absolutely. you probably won't get the results that you expect. You know, there's three things for me. There's the, the, I ate a healthy meal at the weekend chat. Oh, that's it. The classic. Uh, I use the Nando sauce. Isn't that just like hot sauce? No, it's not. 
And then the third, <laughs> the, third, the, third, the third one is the research. You know what's funny about that? When I, when I go to Nando's, I say the same thing to myself sometimes. It's just basically like, hot sauce. I'm this, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, well, I had a client that took the Nando's sauce out and actually started weighing their vegetables and dropped two kilos in a week. So it matters. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so you need to make sure you get your sort of self on the Nando's sauce there, mate. You're looking a bit chunky. <laughs> when you start that muscle building phase. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is uh, the research on guesstimating. Uh, we we just published well, didn't publish a study. We we posted a study in the Facebook group um, two days ago about the the research on on restaurant meals and actually like how six percent of all restaurant meals out of I think it was, it was a data set of thirty thousand or thirteen thousand that only six percent were under six hundred calories. And the average meal, which was 49% of all meals at restaurants, were um, 977 calories on average. And this goes back to the episode 61, I think it was, where we said that you've got to buffer like 1,000 calories for a, an evening meal. And that's just the main meal. That doesn't involve me. That doesn't involve dessert, starters, or drinks. And that's the harsh reality of guesstimating and eating out at the same time is that it, it's, too, it's too tough to call. And it's, and it's, it's a hard variable to replace and, and measure. Um, so, you know, when we talk about this, the people guesstimating, you know, it's a very, very real thing and people get comfortable with, um, the, the daily processes that they do, you know, liken it to brushing your teeth. You know, you probably don't brush your teeth as effectively as you could have done because it's just a habit and you're just doing it. You know, if you looked at how you could brush your teeth, you could probably do it a lot, a lot better on a day-to-day basis, but because it's a habit and you're, you're doing things just on autopilot, things kind of slip away. Your effectiveness of that skill gets less. So, you know, whether it is you're, you're weighing your chicken and, and you used to cut the, the extra five grams off or the extra 10 grams off that when you put the breast in the, in, in the, the weighing cup, or you did just do a handful of rice instead of actually weighing it out 50 grams, or you did lick the spoon after the peanut butter. They all matter. All matter. Yeah. And that, comes, uh, that leads in nicely to uh, the buffer. And, and how to properly buffer. Again, we've covered this a little bit in, in episode 61, but it links tight, it links closely here because um, people wrongly guesstimate their buffer and they, they don't account for enough calories for it. And, and again, they, they end up slipping into uh, a maintenance calories uh, throughout the week. And as a result, they don't lose any body fat if that's their goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that happens way, way too much, way too much. Um, buffering, buffering three eggs and one piece of toast for a um, for a KFC is not really, <laughs> is not really the same thing. Um, <laughs> so you know that happens all the time. Well, people say I drop my protein shakes. I dropped two 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 hundred calorie protein shakes, and I had a meal out in the evening. Um, yeah, it doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, you probably need to read our articles from now on. <laughs> yeah. And let's let's stay on this process phase because now we've you know we've talked about the initial high motivation. Then we go through the dip, the dip in both precision and the dip in motivation. Uh, then we have the the gathered momentum, and then we have that period where you know you go balls to the walls, pull the pin, and really go for it. Now, before around that time. You're probably also going to get. You're also probably going to be in the shape of your life, and you're going to be uh, leaner than you've ever been. And it's, you're going to be exposing yourself to social 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 situations more than normal. Um, and you're going to start getting comments, and these might be positive or negative. But we're going to talk about the negative because that's what we hear a lot of. We hear a lot of, "Oh, you look so thin," or "Oh, you look so ill." Or have you not been feeding yourself? Or when are you going to stop the diet? Or when are you going to eat some real food? All of these comments starts creeping in. And this can get to you if, if you're not aware of it or you're not expecting it. And you're expecting, you're going out and you're expecting to everyone to say to you, oh, you look great. You know, you're in the shape of your life. Amazing. Well done to you. But instead, you get, uh, you, look, you look terrible. And this can be really uh, demotivating for people. And I always hear it in, when, I, when, I, when I reach out to other people's clients or when I reach out to my own clients, like, how are you getting on with certain things? And a common theme is this social stigma. And it's across all communities, all, all around the world. It's not just, you know, where we thought it was. It's all around the world. And it's, 
uh, it's insane. And it really does, you know, it really does anger me when I hear this because people getting into shape and taking charge and taking ownership of their health shouldn't be looked down upon. It, it should be seen as a positive. And it, it's, it's really critical that, you know, we, we, we spend time on this podcast today talking about this and arming people with the information and the tools that they need to be able to withstand this criticism, which it actually is. And, and it shouldn't be criticism. It should be positive comments, but people just aren't getting that from other people. And it'd be good now to talk about the way that they should be reacting. Not, not the outside people, but the, the people who are going through the journey because they need to be strong and not give in to this. I, I, it's a tough one and it's almost like you know you would you can advise things and we can speak about it today but you truly have to believe within yourself that you're doing the right thing and I think that's I think that's the the biggest thing for most of our clients that are kind of getting questioned it's like you have you have to believe that you you, you are finally putting your health first you are putting you know your you know the generation ahead of you um, first, you know, your, your kids, your, your husband, your wife, your, your cousins, you know, you're putting them first because you're, you're, you're actually focusing on yourself. And it's very important to know that people will, will react to you in a negative way to actually f- fuel their own bias towards why they're not doing anything or what they've heard on the radio or what they've heard in the mainstream media or what granny uh, used to do and, and what that means to her about, um, you know, someone getting leaner and, and someone looking like they've, they've lost weight, you know, for, for someone in the, the older generations that, that, that may stem, you know, to bad things back in the day, or, you know, you, you, you could probably tell me a bit more about that, but, you know, Exactly. That. It's not ignorance and they're not trying to be harsh on you. This is more relating to the older generation. The older generation aren't trying to be harsh on you. They just don't know any different. And they just have that, there's a lack of education on this subject. And it comes, it does come down from a generational thing, you know, from, from back in the day uh, when they were coming from, you know, a lot less and, and, and food was, you know, was obviously sometimes scarce. So cutting it out would, would kind of stem bad memories here or, it's always been seen as being healthy as having you know a bit more body fat so a lot of it's kind of ingrained into into cultures going back generations um so it's not necessarily ignorance it's more just a lack of education here uh but with when it comes to social circles and it comes to people that are similar you know similar ages to you your friends your so-called friends that's when it's that's when it really troubles me because that's their insecurities being reflected out and they're basically, you know, um, vocalizing them. They're vocalizing their insecurities and their own uh, issues out on you. And then, because of their insecurities, you 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 get the, your own insecurities. You know, you were probably feeling great before you walked into that room, and they kind of wanted to tell you that you know, you you drinking diet coke is is stupid when everyone else is on the beers. Um, I know. Some people, some people will use use it in social situations to to kind of you know, ridicule you, but like they will they will make fun of you because they 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 probably wanted to do the same thing, or they're jealous of the fact is that you've been able to abstain from drinking or been you know not had the burger and chips because a lot of people what what you might not realize is that people. Um, do things because of the environment that they're around. You know, if you had a group of ten friends. I can guarantee you three, three, out of, three to four of those 10 people don't actually fancy drinking, but all of them have got pints in their hands. And they, all, they, all, they are all doing it because A, someone has said, oh, do you want a pint? And they've gone yes uh, to, fe- to seem favorable in that situation, that environmental situation. Or they've done it because they know that they will get ridiculed or, or made fun out of if they don't or they have to ask, answer a difficult question. And I think... If, if you are to kind of uh, go into these situations, you are going to have to realize that you're going to have to have a difficult conversation with someone. Not, not in the sense of that you're going to have to go like, on, uh, be uber, you know, aggressive with them or be super stern. But, you know, it will be one or two questions that you've probably never answered before. You know, why are you doing this? And we, sp- we spoke about this on episode 61 again, where if you explain to people the why behind why you're doing it, a lot of people will understand. But, you know, a lot of people haven't had that exposure to answering those questions before. 
So it's it's a lot harder when you are in those social situations and you are in a pub and people are going, oh, why are you drinking Diet Coke or why are you not eating with us or why are you not eating that food? Normally you have two plates of food instead of one plate of food. What's going on? You know, it's very it's very it's a hard hard thing to talk about because you don't want to kind of you know potentially open up your feelings uh, at that moment in time. Exactly, and this isn't saying that you can't be social. You can't have a drink or you can't have a, you can't have a meal out and nothing like that. It's just, if you're going through a phase where it might require that extra bit of sacrifice, then you have to stay strong to what you want to do and what you believe in and, and the journey that you're on. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always about what, it's about what you want, not what the environment or what your friends want. Um, if you, you truly believe that following this plan is, is best for you and your priorities, then you know, go after it. Go, go whole, uh, wholeheartedly after what you want. Because at the end of the day, when that when that evening's finished and you've 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 gave into temptation, the only person that has to deal with that is is yourself. Um, and and whether it's going to be through guilt or whether it's going to be through um, backlash, whether it's going to be like, oh well, this is not working, so I'm going to I'm going to give up. You know, um, you still have to deal with that, and you're still accountable for your actions. You know, there's there's no off and on switch when it comes to uh, uh, <laughs> life, and, um, and 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 calories going in and calories going out and the the law of thermogenesis. One thing we've known is in a number in, in a certain in a certain group of clients is there's that fear of being accountable to someone else or even to yourself, and because of that fear, they never actually jump on and take action on their goals because they're living. They don't want to be. They don't want to admit that they haven't achieved what they've set out to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I got a few clients like that that will, you know, openly say that they 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 avoid accountability. They avoid um, the setting of goals just because they might not reach them. And for those people, that it may just be that they need to to set smaller, smaller goals, like really small goals, because they may have not set something and achieved it before. You know, you may be 35 years old and you may have gone through university, you may have gone through life and you may have gone through, you know, a 10 to 15 years of a certain career. But you may have never actually set a goal for yourself personally, for yourself and, and come through with it. And that may be daunting, and it, and it, and it is daunting. Imagine that you know not not having no experience about you know your ability to come through on a situation, or have the ability to kind of know that you've got this got this process on lock, and you'd be able to follow it a hundred percent. You know the doubt, the the <coughs> sorry the fear, and um, all aspects like that, and the unknown. Um, it, it must be really tough to be to kind of have those things playing with you because you could be 35, you could be 40, and, and not have held yourself accountable to to much nowadays. So I, you know, those people just need smaller goals. They need smaller uh, to get a win, to get a win somewhere, and and, and maybe after maybe after a short period of time, that's when they 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 set a goal and they're accountable to that goal but uh, you know that accountability will come in steps obviously we talk about the three levels of accountability all of the time but for someone one of those might just have to be enough um uh, but it, it, it's difficult because the, those people are probably the ones that can, can definitely achieve their goal. They're just blinded by their own um fear of 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 the whole process Exactly. Before we move on to the consolidation phase, let's finish up on the process. And one thing we haven't touched upon is uh, in, in this period where you're as lean as you've ever been, uh, you're getting uh, harder and harder into the deficit and your training starts to suffer. And this is your strength training. And for a lot of people, this is their outlet in the day. And you know, when they're making progressive overload in the gym and they're adding weight to the bar, it motivates them and, and makes them, you know, uh, it provides that sense of achievement on a weekly basis. And then all of a sudden you get to a period in your diet where the absolute strength numbers take a hit. And this can be quite demotivating for someone, especially if they associate with numbers in the gym with their success on a diet. And so I think the best thing to do here is to shift your focus from an absolute strength focus to a relative strength and look at how strong you are compared to your body weight compared to before. So there's a couple of things there. So switch from absolute to relative and compare uh, your old numbers, uh, your previous body weights. And if you can do that 
and each week you maintain your weight or even if it drops slightly on, on a dumbbell press, for example, but you're three, four kilos lighter, that should be seen as progress, uh, as, uh, as a progression. Uh, and this can be a, a, an important what part of keeping you motivated through this phase and it taking you over that finish line, especially when you're you know, really grinding, um, whether it's uh, the Hitman grind or the Bagella grind or whichever, whichever grind you're on, um, it can keep you motivated throughout this period. Yeah, it's it, it, and you know what? It's it's really infuriating to be able to see a hundred kilo dude uh, lift the weights that you're lifting, and may have not even trained before. Versus, you know, you you being seventy kilos or sixty kilos or wherever you are in your fat loss journey. You know, uh, looking at absolute strength means means nothing when you're getting leaner. It really doesn't. You know, um, benching a hundred kilos, a hundred can. And then being 80 kilos and benching 95 is actually progression. Um, so the numbers play a bit of a trick with you on that one. Um, it, the lower you get in your weight, the less you're going to be able to lift. Um, you know, unless you are seasoned athletes, you know, where you stay at a weight category and you you build up. You know, um, so being able to like look at relative strength from whether it is like one times your body weight or 1.2 times your body weight, 1.3 times your body weight in like squat, squatting, deadlift and bench pressing will, will be often a good ways to measure um, that that thing that, that we want to try and manage. Um, the interesting point about like relative strength is is that it's quite inverse, is that you, you, you see your weight coming down, you see the weights coming down. Um, and, and, it, and it plays with your head a little bit because you, you potentially could be getting a loss in, in reps so you could be getting you know less less weight on the bar um, but based on your on your scale weight it, 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 it's, a, it's a win so the analysis side of things the the headspace that the relative strength versus an uh, absolute strength plays with you is, is a tough one to kind of manage um, so making sure that you've got a good strategy in place with with that to kind of uh, and a deeper understanding of, uh, of of whether it's progress or regression um, and maybe analyzing your your sessions is it probably a good point for people in that situation and what I would say is even if we're looking at the relative strength focus do your best to try and maintain your absolute numbers because if you can and you can try and hold on to it as much as possible it's going to really make a difference so this isn't to say and give you an excuse to start dropping off your numbers as you're getting leaner. You absolutely want to try and keep your, your best numbers. It's just, it's just making sure that if you do see a dip uh, in certain lifts, which you will in, in various pressing exercises, uh, especially, then it's nothing to panic about. And on that same note, I've also noticed with some, some guys is as their lifts go down uh, as a natural cause of, of going, being lighter in body weight, they use that as an excuse to eat up more because they say, I don't want to go down below a certain body weight. And it's that whole fear of an attachment to the scale number that we've talked about uh, before in our how heavy will you be when you're lean article. And this can be a real bro- roadblock for people who, who want to get lean. They, want, their, they want, their, uh, want to achieve their goals, but they're so fixated on being above a certain number that they don't allow themselves to get leaner. Absolutely. It's one of my biggest bugbears when it comes to training guys is that they'll either have an attachment with a, a weight that they've lifted previously or they'll, they'll have an attachment with a, a scale weight and they will have like a, let's say a no fly zone, which is effectively, if you mention the word 60 or anywhere near <laughs> 60, they will go, well, I'm not going to get there. I don't want to get there. I don't want to be skinny. I was 15 the last time I was, I was, I was, I was 60 kilos or whatever it is. And I don't want to be there again. It's like, in reality, if you want the goal that you want, it doesn't matter about the scales, it matters about what you look like. And, and, and you will have to be low. You will have to be low on the, on the scale if you've not spent a lot of time building muscle. You know, even if you spent a lot of time building muscle and you were 50 kilos when you started, if you've spent 10 years building muscle and you're 60 kilos now, you've built 10 kilos of muscle. You may not be where you want to be, but you know, if you're attached to the scales and wanting to be that 75 kilo dude who wears a medium T-shirt... You're living in a dream. Get smaller T-shirts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And most people overestimate how much body fat they have and underestimate how much muscle they have. It's something I always say to people, but it, it can't be said enough in how much, if you, as soon as you can let go of that attachment, you can allow your results to come. And it's exactly that 60 gear mark that people get scared about or sub-70. Anything the word six at the beginning, don't even mention five. 
<laughs> some people if they're sort of a certain height will have to go below 60 kilos and it's it's quite depressing but is the reality is you just haven't got enough muscle at that, at that point i mean when i when i stepped on stage in 2017 i was 70 71.5 kilos and i'm five for ten and I, okay granted i was absolutely shredded but even if i was lean at a photo shoot level it would have been 74 to 75 and i've been lifting for 10 years so if you've only been lifting for one or two years or three years you're not going to be anything near that if you're five foot ten. So it's, it's important to manage the ex- expectations and to understand how much body fat and, and weight you need to drop in order to achieve your goals in that process phase. And I'd just like to tag on to that as well, is that let's just clarify what lean is. So if you're a guy who's about 70, 75 kilos and you're like, I want to be lean, I've only got a little bit to lose. If you don't have veins in your arms, if you don't have separation between your bicep and tricep when you when you uh, you contract it, if you don't see little striations or, or things moving in your shoulders when you're doing side raises, and you don't see veins in any other places, and it, and it and when you jump up and down, there's a bit of jiggling that goes on in the midsection. You know, you have a, you have a bit to lose, and and that's kind of reality. You go off veins go off like jiggling and, and go, and go off. And, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately will, you know, t- there's two types of people. One person that has fat storage of the gods, which is effectively like women on Instagram is where they're, they're moderately got a high level of body fat, but it's around their boobs and their bum and they can show that off and they look very low lean. And you've got guys in the same category where they, they actually hold fat, fat around their arms so their arms look massive and they've got like you know a, a fat chest or a, or a phat chest and, uh, and and they think that's muscle they truly believe that that's muscle but let, let's just clarify if you ever got veins on your arms that or most of the time if your if your chest doesn't move in terms of um like the, the fibers when you squeeze it it's fat um, so for, for, for you guys that are above 75 kilos and, and you're thinking that you've only got a couple of kilos to lose, you know, this is a message to you guys, you know, let's lose 10 kilos and see what you're about. Yeah, there's most guys, yeah, the most guys need to drop a minimum of 10, probably 20. <laughs> Just the reality of it. And if you can get your head around that, you'll be fine. And then you'll be okay with it and you won't have that attachment to scale. You just think, okay, I've got more body fat to do, body fat to lose. And you you mentioned veins and looking, but you can also just pinch your pinch your stomach. If you can grab stuff, you've got body fat. <laughs> so, okay, so we've finished the process phase. We've got as lean as possible for this phase, or you've reached your goal. Now we're moving into consolidation, or otherwise known as uh, reverse dieting. Um, what happens here? Well, this is the this is the proverbial shit storm. And and what I mean by that is that this is a combination of your body will be hungry. You will have the feeling and the sense of achievement of something. And now kind of the, the transition between goals is very, very hard to kind of latch onto. Nothing will be ever as strong as your first diet and your first buy-in. So that when you come to that, um, that, that next goal, that next training focus, it will, it will never be... A, enough to kind of keep you on track there's no reason for you after the 12 weeks to not eat that burger to not eat that donut you know you've been restricting yourself for 12 weeks you can have sweets you can have the food and that's where people make the mistake they believe that they're entitled or deserving of 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 cheat meals of caving into their feelings and at that point in time we know that there is a you know the 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 signaling process within your body is wired to overeating um and and you're going to you're going to eat and you're going to eat and you're going to eat and you're going to enjoy yourself. You're going to overconsume. You're probably going to catch up on a lot of social events. And at this moment in time, you know the research is very clear. You can gain a lot of fat very very quickly if you consume fats and carbs in in high amounts. You know the research is very very clear. A lot of people will go, oh no, it's only water. But I'm here to tell you today, the research says that you can get fat very quickly. Yeah, I've done it. Oh, I've done it. I, I nearly drowned in a swimming pool in Thailand because I got so fat very quickly. Did I tell you that story? That was funny. Yeah, you told me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, this phase is the shitstorm. You know, you've got all of these things going on. What do you do? How do we control this? Um, you know, how do we make it into that safe passage into that muscle building phase? And, you know, 
it is it, the the Steven Gerrard of, of of the of the process. Um, it, it, without this phase, without this uh, two weeks to four weeks, you know, you are going to you go going to not be able to have a muscle building phase. You know, it, it, in relation to like you know climbing a mountain, you got your five different phases. Is all about the, like climbing a mountain. You know, the first phase is that you start at ground zero, you're getting all your bags on. And you're learning what it takes to to climb the mountain. You're learning from an instructor. Then you know during the process phase, you're walking up the mountain. You're you're learning about you know where to put your hands, where to put your feet. You know what line am I using? You know the the, the hard yards, the tough um, that you're going through. And then you get to the top. You go through this whole process, and you find that top. You, you get to that top point of Kilimanjaro, wherever you, whatever mountain you want to you want to put yourself on. You hit that pinnacle. You, you've, you've tried something that you've probably never done before. You have expended more energy than you've ever done before. You've tested yourself. You know, people say that, you know, the last 24 to 48 hours of a mountain climb like Kilimanjaro is not physical, it's mental. You know, you put yourself out there way beyond what the capabilities you have. And that's effectively what you do during this fat loss phase or, you know, your photo shoot. And you get to that top. And then for 10 minutes... For, for for a short period of time, you are enlightened. It's amazing. The views are amazing. It's fantastic. But as the as that closes off, you realize you're at the top of a mountain. You've still got to get down. And this is exactly the consolidation phase. You know, the consolidation phase is the safe passage down and the guidance through to ground zero. And what that means is that, you know, the... <laughs> on the way down it's more treacherous you're tired you're weary you're you know this is like you're hungry your your, your feelings are, are, of restriction are, are gone your, your elements of willpower are definitely now now kind of are, are tested and, and and they've they've resolved for the 12 weeks but now the leash is gone and and you, you're wanting to eat but, have you seen all of the ring no okay so there's this there's a scene i just it just came to me now in the final bit, right? So Frodo, the main character, has just put the ring in Mordor, which is the mountain, and the ring disappears. The whole mountain explodes. Now him and Samwise Gamgee are now stranded on this, this like uh, stranded in Mordor on this mountain with lava flowing everywhere. Okay, so if we if we use that same analogy you've just done, dropping of the ring is getting that picture up on on the wall of of the RNC wall. Now the mountain's exploded. And they're stuck in the lava um, of 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 the Mount of Mount Doom, and then Gandalf. You heard of Gandalf? Yeah, yeah, I know Gandalf. Yeah. Yeah. Gandalf comes and rescues them, and he rescues them with his birds, and then and he flies them back home. And this is exactly what the consolidation phase is. It's it's that safe passage back to the Shire, back to the <laughs> bring their beers and have have their have their meals in the in the green in the green nice Shire, and it's exactly. <laughs> The consolidation phase is basically Gandalf saving you from Mordor, <laughs> saving you from the lava. <laughs> you back home. Well, yeah, it, yeah, effectively, <laughs> yeah. I was just going to go for Mount Kilimanjaro, but you know it's all right. You know, the Hobbit and all. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but like, uh, aside the analogy, you've got so much going on at play from a psychological aspect and physiological aspect that. Freedom at the moment in time is desired from you personally, but is the worst possible thing that you can give yourself. You know, we we cringe every single time a client says that they want to go on holiday after the the day after the photo shoot. You know, how many times do we say, we hear that? You know, oh, day after the photo shoot, we're going to go for on holiday. I'm like, okay, that's recipe for that. There, there goes ten kilos, or there goes five kilos, and it's very, 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 very minimal. Does it ever happen in any other way? You know, it, you know, we're, we're speaking from a, a position of seeing hundreds and hundreds of people and, and actually a high percentage of those that don't go through a consolidation phase are, are, are dieting six weeks after they've finished their diet to get off the weight that they've put on. Yeah, the dieting after the diet. And it's an unnecessary diet there. And if I think the biggest problem is seeing, seeing the, the, the final bit of fat loss as the end point and not realizing that it's a journey instead. 
there's, there's no there's no off switch you know it's just a switching of phases it's the changing of the guard it's um it's just moving it, it's it's progression and 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 it's element you know you get so focused on the goal and that's okay to do, you know, as we, we spoke about process and it being very important, but also having a goal is very important as well and achieving goals uh, to, to, to feel that, you know, that, that level of excitement and that, you know, that fulfillment. But you also have to recognize that the goal that you've, you've placed is not, is not the finish. It's not the end point. Um, it's just one, one moment in time that you've worked towards and that tomorrow you're still going to be accountable for the same amount of things. And, and it's not living your day like it's the last day because, you know, it's, it's not going to end tomorrow. With a goal like fat loss, you open yourself up to so much to go wrong. And if you, if you view it as the last day, as soon as you think, okay, I'm going to revert, I'm going to go back to the old way. Or I'm going to, I can't wait to have that. I can't wait to do this. Then you're just going to, you're going to reverse it. All the hard work you've done so, so fast which is why it's so important to be aware of what's to come afterwards and to be ready to go through that next period. Because if you don't go through that next period, you will end up dieting again four weeks later. And if you do go through that period, you can then uh, set yourself up to be in shape, not in the, be in the shape of your life for life and not just uh, have it as a flash in the pan. You can actually consolidate and maintain that condition or even just above that condition for a very long period of time. And we see it over and over again in people who do successfully uh, accomplish a consolidation phase. But we also see the other side of the spectrum where people think, okay, I'm done now. And uh, four weeks later, they're up eight, 10 kilos and, they, and they're wondering what all the hard work is for. And I would just stress for those people that are currently going through the diet to be humble enough to know that this is going to happen to you. And what I mean is that I, I told six people in the last week that this is going to happen and all six of them didn't believe me. And then a week, 10 days later, when they all put on a little bit of weight, I've all come back to me and said, Nathan, you were right. I should have listened to you in the beginning. And it's not like a case of ha, I told you so because Nathan's fucking brilliant, but it is a case of that. This is happening to everybody because this is what a diet does to you. You know, you can, it's effectively controlled starvation as much as we want to call it a diet, it's controlled starvation and that has repercussions. And this consolidation phase is getting away those repercussions effectively. Yeah. And you have to give your body what, what, what it needs at this point and not what it, well, not what the dieting braid needs. Yeah. And not what it wants. Yeah. Not, not what the dieting braid wants. That's exactly it. But let's also be, um, Let's also use like a real life example here. And how would people actually do this consolidation phase? Does it mean that they carry on dieting, but at a lesser amount? Or are they eating more food that's clean? Or are they uh, doing more buffers and just living out, living like their previous lifestyle? What does it actually entail in the real world? I think for the- what can people expect to go through? Oh, I, th- I think so many ways to skin a cat, but at the same time is we, we understand the drawbacks and the pros and the cons of this situation. And it, and it always comes back to probably at this moment in time, having the least amount of decisions to make more so now that you've, you're off the leash um, and actually just nailing uh, a plan with a higher amount of calories. And that doesn't mean, you know, five days on two days off type of thing. It means, you know, probably consolidating for 14 days again, like the cleansing of the palate phase with a higher amount of calories, but, you know, using sources that will take away hunger. So, you know, the easiest options are, at, you know, let's say you're an 80 kilo dude, you finished your diet on, 14, 1500 calories or whatever arbitrary number you want to put it as, you know, that would look like dashing in 500 calories worth of potato. And that would be the only change. They would have the same diet that they had the week before the shoot and they would just repeat it. And they would be, and I would implore you if you're doing that to, for your end date to batch cook all your meals the day before. So you have nothing like the, the worst thing I did when I was dieting and when I didn't do a consolidation phase multiple, multiple times that I dieted was that I had no plan for Monday. I had nothing for Monday. So when I, when I had Saturday and, and I did, I did a shoot on Sunday by Monday morning, I was six kilos up because I had no plan. I didn't have any meals to do. I didn't, I didn't know where I was going. And you know, and then you come around to doing the food shopping or whatever you do and you're like, 
yeah, I reckon get some cocoa pops in that or some bagels in that, you know, or whatever it is. And you're like, oh my God, I've got no plan. I've got no meal plan. I've got no structure. And you're going from what was a safe zone, this happy safe zone, which is structure, strategy, um, non-negotiables. And then you go into the, what, and everything goes and I've got no plan at all. Although. People might be listening to this and thinking, why do we keep banging on about the consolidation phase? Why do we always talk about reverse dieting? You know, this isn't the first time we've spoken about it. We spent half this podcast talking about it. And it's because we've both been through it ourselves really badly. And we've seen it so many times over the years uh, with, with clients who thought they'd be okay, but they're not. And it's basic human psychology and human physiology that this will happen, which is why it's our duty to be able to continuously drum this, like, drum this beat and make sure that we're, everyone who's going through a dieting phase, whether it's now, whether it's in the future, or um, whenever it is, that they're aware that, that it's not the end once you get to your fat loss goal. It absolutely needs to be a structured plan afterwards. And it's perhaps more important to have a structured plan then. And it's going to be more, it's going to be more difficult to be able to execute it which is why having your systems, your strategy and your structure, or otherwise known as the three S's in place are so critical. And, and do you know what? My heart breaks every single time. Every, like, you know, you care about that client so much. And, and, and the, the kicker for me is always is that you get an email saying how brilliant this has been and how, how amazing their changes have been. And then two days later, you get the, the email that is the, I fucked up email. And, 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 you know, this is why we're doing this podcast. This is why we're doing this banging on about this reverse dieting, because, you know, that feeling that you feel at the end of your, your transformation should never ever, it shouldn't be, um, you know, dampened by the fear of guilt or the fear of, you know, uh, it not being there anymore. You know, that, that feeling that you're feeling, that self-confidence, that, 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 that happiness, that sense of achievement, the things that you get at the end of a transformation, they should all last for a while, a long while. You know, that is why the physical is the vehicle to the mental. But when you don't consolidate, you lose all of the things that the vehicle has brought you to. It's basically you're emptying out that car and then burning it. And it's really hard to take as a coach, as someone that gives a shit about the clients because, you know, firstly we've been there, so we know how much it hurts from a personal level. And secondly, you know, we understand how, how much an individual has changed their life and they've changed their routine and they've changed their happiness. They've changed their self-confidence. And then all, all of this is effectively uh, to nothing because they don't consolidate. And, and, I, and then when people say, I'm not going to renew after the, the three months, you're like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not just three months, whatever that end goal is, it, whatever their fat loss period ends and they say, okay, I'm good now. I always panic because I'm like, shit, this is the worst time to finish because this is when you need us most for, for, for not, it's not the accountability. It's, it's the tools and being able to know how to react to the different situations because it's not just reverse dieting, um, the, the, the amount of calories and reducing the cal and reducing the cardio, it's reversing the psychological impact of dieting as well. And it's reversing all the habits that you use uh, to get you into crazy shape and making them more normalized and bringing you back to normality while keeping you in condition. It's doing all these things, which is much more than just saying add 50 calories each week. Uh, again, it's always never about the X's and O's. Never. No, not at all. And every person will be different. It's, it's, you know, we've got an article on like the, guy, the ultimate guide to reverse dieting, which is great. And it gives you a real good blueprint on how to do it. But it's, it's one thing knowing, okay, I'm going to add 300 calories this week. But it's another thing knowing that when you get to the end of the day, you're also going to be probably still hungry. Uh, you're you're, you're going to be exposed in a social situation, which is going to mean more calories. Uh, then you're going to feel guilty. Then you might eat more. And then you feel even more guilty. Then you repeat it. And then it becomes a cycle which you can't really get yourself out of um, because you weren't prepared. And you haven't got the system in place to be able to deal with it. And, and this, is when, this is when the binging starts. And then, and then you've got no reason to say no as well. You've got no reason to say no to that extra biscuit. 
No. And was- then an extra biscuit becomes 10 biscuits. Um, and the problem with, when it, when it comes to things like binging, is it's usually, it, it, it's, yes, it's, a, it's an issue on just eating, uh, lack of control, but it's usually linked to an emotional, uh, an internal emotional problem or pain point that hasn't been dealt with. And it's being solved through food. And, and a method of escapism. And now that you've lost the, almost the, the, the tunnel vision of a fat loss goal, now you need to find another level of escapism, which is found in food, which is where the binging comes in because it's so easy to do in that period of time. And I've been there and you've been there as well. Uh, so we can both relate to it and, and speak from personal experience that it's a very difficult place to be in and to get out of. Yeah. And before we exit this little doom and gloom, doom and gloom sequence, uh, <laughs> the last thing that we kind of see as well is, is, is when you're going through this, you will isolate yourself uh, and, and you, will, you will cease communication with your coach. You will avoid the reality check that someone will give you. You, you avoid the accountability. You avoid the, the notion that you, know, you can do something about it. And the reason that both of us are sitting here today and, and able to talk about it quite openly without either both of us crying or, you know, uh, having still having the issues is that we took accountability for our actions and our, got, a, got a lid on it or put a lid on it. Uh, and it, 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 for me, it took 10 years, you know, that, that's how long it took me to get over this. Um, but I did this, I did, I did it multiple times and, and, and really screwed myself over stupidly. But, you know, it, it all came down to to one thing, and that was that, you know, I was always responsible for what happened, you know, going into my mouth and the actions that I take. Um, and that's how kind of I stopped doing it. And I, I, I finished my binge eating, as well as removing things within the environment and, you know, cues and all sorts about the same reason, cookies type of question. But, you know, it was all about the accountability side of things. And, and, and an important part you touched on there is the environment that you're in um, and, and being self-aware of what's going on in your mouth and, and what are you putting inside it um, and just taking ownership for everything you're doing. And, you know, you said it took you 10 years. It, it, it didn't take me that long because I didn't, I had my first like hard extreme diet in 2014 uh, when I competed in bodybuilding for the first time. And I went through a period of binging for a whole year straight. Like I was just literally binging, dieting, binging, dieting. Um, you know, I went from like absolutely shredded to back to skinny fat within eight weeks. And then I just kept repeating the cycle of, okay, I'm going to try and lean up, get control. And then what I do is when I, when I try to lean up, I do it the flexible way. I try and, um, you know, just wing it. And then what really made the difference for me was, um, I'd, I'd say it was, it took about a year uh, and it was also just, it was gaining accountability from someone else, but also more than that, it was, um, I, I just simplified my diet again. And it comes back to what we spoke about earlier in that I, I tried to be less sexy with it. And I just tried to get rid of all the, the, the trigger foods. Cause it's usually a trigger food that's in place that completely blows it for someone. Like it could be a chocolate or it could be a biscuit or it could be a rice cake. Even like it might be one little simple thing that can completely cause a trigger where you have, you lose control. And it's about being really self-aware and realizing what your triggers are, what your environments are, and uh, what you need to gain, regain the structure that you once had. Because if you can get into shape for a, a bodybuilding show or a photo shoot or just even any, anything, getting, getting, getting into shape requires a lot of discipline. So it's clearly in you, and it's everyone who can go through it has taught themselves that they can do it. And it's about finding that again uh, in a happy medium that you can allow you to continue as a lifestyle. And, that, and that's essentially where I am now, which is why I can go away. And for, it's the first time I've ever done this. And, you know, when I used to go on a holiday before, I used to always come back he- a lot heavier. I used to come back puffier. I used to feel like crap all the time. Whereas now when I go away, I come back pretty much the same weight. And I never used to do that. And, and I think it's only because now I'm able to self-regulate and I have less of an emotional attachment to foods to, to satisfy various things and, and getting rid of that has helped me a lot in managing weight, uh, throughout my life now. And that it becomes, it's become more of a lifestyle rather than me thinking 
okay, it's off season. I'm going to bulk and go really big. And, you know, I've gone these dirty bulks that you've seen me do like multiple times over the years. And a lot of it's just for, uh, an excuse to have like chocolate and rice with butter and, and just hate a load of that. Uh, and thinking I'm getting muscle. And then I do extreme cuts. I've proven I can get into amazing shape. You know, I've had striated glutes, striated uh, triceps, all of that. So I, I can do that as well. What I've never managed to do until probably the last year is be able to hold a steady, a happy medium in between. And, and that's ultimately where everyone wants to go to. They don't want to be shredded year round and they don't want to be big and bulky year round. They just want to be in that happy medium where they can be lean, they can be happy, they can feel good, feel energetic, get all the the physical benefit, get all the mental benefits that a physical being in physical shape brings, but without the extremes. Exactly. That's what's happened to me this year as well. Like uh, my goal is to, to maintain between 60 and 64 kilos. And I've been able to do that based on the same exact things that you, you spoke about then a hundred percent. And I've struggled with my weight for years and years and years and years. And doing those exact same things that you're talking about has, has, has really, really changed the game for me. Not thinking of food as a reward or not thinking of food as, as emotions or feelings. No. no. So it's a very powerful thing when, happen, when it happens. It happens. And there's, uh, go, go. Go, go. I was just saying, there's, like, there's no shame uh, when people are struggling. There's no shame in, in taking like significant drastic action when you know that that's the right cause. And what I mean by that is that you know people will you know, let's say you finish your 12 week or someone buys you something like a jar of something or a box of something. And you know, that's a trigger food. And yet you keep it in the house. There is no shame, no shame in, in being in that. There is no shame. Uh, and there's no loss of money that will, will take it. Like if I, if I told you, you'd be happy, uh, for 10 pound less, um, than being sad and guilty would you take it a lot of people would probably pay the 10 pounds to be happy as opposed to guilty and sad but yet won't throw away uh, a tub of peanut butter or a, or a box of cereal that are, is plaguing their guilt and um, and sadness you know throw away that old food that's making you you trigger you know uh, have no shame in in T- taking one for the team on that side of things because that is a big thing as well and a lot of people will you know buy boxes of boxes of protein bars because they are uh, on a special offer and they will buy a 12 pack and they will go through them a lot quicker because they are still a trigger food it's a rapid it's a rapid chocolate bar effectively um there's no shame in in binning them there's no shame in losing a bit of money to to have happiness and you, the, the protein bar example is very timely because I actually had a bit of an episode when I was away on the weekend and I bought a pack of protein bars because I was told that in Iceland everything is so expensive that you can't even eat out. <laughs> I don't know why I, I believe this because yes, it was expensive. It wasn't to the point where you can't eat out. Um, so they were like, oh, you, know, you should prepare and you know, bring your food with you. So I bought a box of protein bars. I've never bought protein bars before because I'm just not a fan of them. But I've always had a sweet tooth for chocolate which is why I have two squares of dark chocolate every day, but that's not dark chocolate. Isn't a trigger food for me. It just, if it's, I just like it, but I haven't really eaten milk chocolate for a long time. And you know, I had a, I had a couple of protein bars. Uh, I had one a day for the first few days. And then on the last day, uh, must have had one just before we went to the airport. And then when I was in the airport, you know, when you're bored and killing time. So I was thinking, Oh, okay. I had a bit of, I had a bit of, uh, Icelandic money left. What can I spend it on? So I bought some food and then I was stuffed and I was really full. And then I was on the plane and I was like, well, this is the plane's delayed. I don't normally eat on planes, but this plane was delayed, but I had some reason I felt like I was triggered by something early in the day. And I knew there was four protein bars sitting in my, in my rucksack below me. So I didn't have all four, but you know, I thought, okay, I'll have one. <laughs> you know? And I had no reason to eat it. And when I got back, I just felt so like, uh, I felt bloated and they, they don't digest well at all. Do they? Like they're, they're, they're horrible. They have to go in the same way they come out. <laughs> they're horrible for digestion. So, and I, I forgot how bad they are for your digestion. And I, I must have had, so I had two that day. So you can imagine like I wasn't feeling good. And I just, and I, and I, and I, and I wrote in my journal that night, I wrote, I think I, I need to dial it in with the food again. Because I think I just lost it a little bit that day. And, um, so I, I'd given all the protein bars away actually. So I had like three or four left, but I just thought I'm not going to eat them because I don't want to, 
And I saw them uh, Monday morning. I saw, oh, should I keep them? Um, you know, just have a one a day, just go through them all again. But I was like, nah, this is a trigger food. And I didn't know it was a trigger food, but it just, it, it's become aware that it is a trigger food. So I think I just need to get rid of it. And, you know, most people think of us as just robots that we don't go through any other stuff and we're, you know, we, nothing applies to us, but we go through exactly the same as everyone else, right? Everything else that we talk about. And the reason why we talk about all this stuff is because we go through ourselves and we not just, we don't just go through it with our clients, but we go through it personally. So we know the struggles of, of managing all the different, uh, responsibilities and, and, and the different emotions that can come with food if you're not aware of it. And it's important that you said that. And I talk a lot about self-awareness in the last like year and a half a lot. And it's because it's something I've tried to become more and more uh, skilled at. And it is a skill. And it's something that needs to be harnessed every day as a muscle. And I try and notice certain triggers in my day before, I, before they get out of hand. For example, yes, uh, three days ago, no, four days ago, or maybe the first night of, just before I went to Iceland, I wrote in my journal. Um, and journaling is a great way to be self-aware, by the way. And I think you've signed the same, the same thing. And I wrote in the journal, I wrote, uh, I think I'm spending too much time uh, looking at other people's Instagram. Because I was wondering, I don't, I don't normally scroll. I'm not really a scroller on Instagram. I don't really go on other profiles. I, am, I, don't, I unfollowed like 50 people last week. But I realized I kept going on to these, like, these profiles where, you know, you, you look at them and you find yourself feeling inferior. <laughs> Did you ever get that? I don't know. Yeah, I think, oh, okay, I don't make enough or I don't live this lifestyle. I don't do this. And, and I was like, what am I doing? Why? I, I call myself like, what the hell am I doing? Here? I need to snap out of this. Um, and so, and people get that with, with physique. Cause I used to do that a lot with physique. I used to always think, oh, this guy's a lot bigger than I am. Or this guy's a lot leaner than I am. Or why don't I got over that? Like quite quickly. I got over that after actually not quickly. It was, it was over. It took me a couple of years to get over that kind of body comparison or body dysmorphia. Um, but I caught myself in the act of looking at social media too much. And then yesterday I wrote something like, I'm going to try and avoid using the phone uh, in the kitchen when other people are around because I found myself slipping into a bad habit. So and this comes, to as well, uh, comes back to food as well. If you're in a consolidation phase, uh, you, can, you can use journaling as a way to keep yourself aware of what you're doing and as a way of keeping yourself accountable to your own feelings and to, your, to yourself. Uh, and much like weighing yourself every day during a consolidation phase is important because again, it's another level of accountability, but writing how you're feeling in relation to your food intake can be a big one. And actually, that's a really important topic that I've, I've noticed with some of my clients as well, because when they're going through this phase, normally I have these people on my WhatsApp to kind of, you know, have them more as one step away from, from, from them, you know, so it's easy accessible. And actually <laughs> on three occasions, Three of them have audio voice messaged me, and as they were over, they were voice messaging me. They realised that they were downloading their thoughts and their feelings to me, and that they'd, they'd not done it before. And they just like they paused the message. All three of them is quite funny. All three of them was like, and then they, they retook the second message, and they were like, "Sorry, I didn't realise I was rambling, uh, but it was really good to download. Can I just continue? I'm just going to continue uh, audioing if that's okay." And then they did. And then they, they spent about the next five to 10 minutes talking about their food, what they've been doing, you know, how it makes them feel and, and downloading. And, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of people don't do this, the stress management techniques or the, the, the downloading that, you know, we do with, with journaling. And, you know, a lot of people either don't, don't see value of it or just don't, you know, don't have it as their technique to use. But there is definitely an element that, during either in this consolidation phase or some are a point where you are struggling in yourself, it, it's time it's time to kind of um, explore your own feelings and, and kind of download it from your brain. Yeah, I've uh, I've had I've come across people who use the check in as a as a journal, and they just download all their thoughts, and they feel much better. They feel much better from it, and, they, and sometimes there isn't much for us to say back. It's more just the case of uh, like appreciating that they've just downloaded a lot of their thoughts and, and, and just journaled uh, a lot of their pain points and, and things they're struggling with and, and working on right now. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> oh, fucking. Okay. Need to like, have a cry into the pillow. 
<laughs> right, so but there are some positive, gonna... there are some positives to a fat loss diet. Let's just go and talk about those. So let's go to the positives now. Okay, so you've mastered this consolidation phase, and this might take you anywhere from four weeks to like in you know like I, like I mentioned for myself a year or for you it was ten years. But let's just say if you've executed this perfectly, you do it between four and eight weeks. Now the next phase is what we like to call the investment phase which can mean a lot of things for different people, but for many, it will mean a period of strength building, muscle building, and making it into a real lifestyle solution for you. Yep, and also um, generation of health uh, as well. In that, um, you know, you've got, you got your lifestyle solutions. You've got kind of, this is the point of where you're, you're figuring out how you want to live your, your week or how you want to live your life based around your health and fitness goals. You know, it's, as we always say, it's always going to be there. There's no off switch. Um, so you need to factor it in, you know, at this point you want to be figuring out, you know, what's sustainable for you over a long period of what, what is this lifestyle solution that we're talking about? You know, is it, is it that you get good value from three sessions a week in the gym? You know, are you doing yoga? Are you trying hiking? Are you, are you trying badminton? You know, uh, what, what are you doing in, in your health and activity that's going to keep you, your mind active, your body active, and obviously take care of that mental health and, and your physique as well. So, you know, during this phase, you're, you know, if your goal is muscle building purely, then obviously you're, you're going to be heavily weighting your, your efforts towards the, the weight room and the resistance training. But, you know, if, if, you, are, if you are looking uh, for a maintenance and, and the weight training is, is, is not, and you did it for the goal, then maybe, you know, looking at other factors, Zumba, uh, activity, go ape, you know, all these different types of things that you can do, gymnastics, um, martial arts. Something where you're learning a craft, maybe it'd be a good idea. Um, and and you, you, you're looking at that coinciding with, you know, how do I, you know, you've now got social events that you're going to. You've now got, you know, life events that you're going to, birthdays, Hanukkahs, Christmas parties, whatever they are. Um, you, you're going to have to deal with them and setting yourself up up in that way you know a lot of people will look at the 5-2 diet as a fad diet but I just think that's real life you know I deal with people on a day-to-day basis and people are, are definitely in couples um, you know shout out to the couples is that they basically do five days of where they go budgetly low on the calories and then they have weekends higher because that's when they're socializing that's when they're together that's when they spend more time with each other and they want food to be a bigger part of integral part of their relationship which is absolutely fine so you know it's about reverse engineering your to find the solution for you um and that's and that's the investment you're investing in yourself you're investing in your future self you're investing in the the generations later on um by having a, you know a good health and you're ultimately putting yourself in a, in a great position uh for the next phase as well yeah and, and for people that for a lot of people it, usually guys in this one it's it's that they want to be a uh, year-round lean and, but also hold good size. And this might mean a period of muscle building, which could last you know, anywhere between six and 18 months uh, at the very minimum. And it's a period where it's, it, it can really, they can make drastic improvements to their physique and then run another fat loss phase after to, to then settle out on, a, on an ideal physique. Uh, and this is a common use of the investment phase outside of just building a lifestyle solution that Nathan talked about just here. Um, where you re- reverse engineer what you want to get to. And, and that is a form of reverse engineering. If you want to say to yourself, I want to be three to four kilos heavier um, at this body weight, uh, at this body fat, then you're going to have to accept that you're going to have to put on uh, a, lot of, a lot of muscle mass to get there um, and, and go through a phase where you might not be as lean for a period. So that's another a goal of this phase. And it all comes down to exactly, uh, exactly that, the reverse engineering of where you want to be and then uh, working backwards accordingly. Yeah, and for those that are in the muscle building phase, you'll be highly prioritizing performance-related goals uh, and, and prioritizing probably calories and protein. And for the people that are in the, that maintenance phase, they're going to be prioritizing you know, enjoying life and being active and, and probably prioritizing just um, managing their calories better. Um, you know, so those people may not have more calories to play with than those people with a concerted goal because, you know, they're probably spreading it out, spreading it out, out, uh, activities, social events and stuff like that. Overall, they will have managed their situation pretty, pretty well.
and that and that last type of goal links very closely to the reward phase, which is pretty much where the the, the ultimate, the kind of holy grail where you want to be, uh, whereby you maintain your body weight, you're living a good lifestyle, and you don't feel restrictive in it, and you can ultimately have your cake and eat it. It sounds sounds bad, but it is exactly that where you can intuitively also regulate your body weight according to different events without ever feeling restricted. And it's a great place to be. It can take a lot of work to get there. So even if you're focusing uh, on in that investment phase of building a lifestyle, that is a goal in itself in being able to make what you're doing a lifestyle. And if you can, if you can uh, habitualize that and make it and, and achieve that, then you will be able to go into the reward phase and on autopilot, be able to regulate your body weight and regulate condition. And if you want to make a push, you can make a push consciously, not uh, accidentally. If you want to get lean, you can get lean consciously, not not accidentally. And yeah. it's having that complete control of your body and the way it, the way it looks and feels that is ultimately the reward phase. Yeah, and you know, and you know, brutally, there is a lot that goes into that. <laughs> it's such a <laughs> like. Uh, let, let, let's just let's just outline how what it takes to to be in a reward phase. So, like, you've got for, for, for even just maintaining your weight. You got to have a good grasp of uh, portion control. You got to understand how to create a buffer uh, and not uh, purge afterwards. You got to understand guessing and and how that affects it. You have got to be able to understand um, your body's feelings and, and whether when when to push and when to back off. You got to be able to ha- have a good relationship with the scales and and not like um, get panicking when it goes up by half a kilo or by let down by a kilo. You got to be able to you know for, for a period of time. You have to be stay injury free uh, and, and exercise effectively. Um, you know that that's already seven things that that goes into just maintaining your weight. That you know over time these these all, all these things get a tick box over time to say okay well now I've got a handle of that. You know you may have got a handle of the buffers and the guesstimating over this period of time, but you may not have you know truly understood what actual portion control is. And and actually you know you may you may find that you struggle on certain things as opposed to different things. You know, order versus ordering a meal and dessert. Maybe your maybe your kind of your Achilles heel. Um, you know, there, there are definitely things that you know you'll find. There's ten to fifteen things that are all in this reward phase for you to kind of conquer. And once you kind of go through this reward phase and you you identify and be self aware of what what the, what the issues you have to to kind of conquer is 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 the moments that you start ticking things off and you start working towards them. Yeah, we will probably need a podcast on itself just to go through this. Um, I'll go through the reward phase, but it's exactly that. And it's it's learning a multiple number of strategies that essentially you can use uh, and master to keep yourself uh, in the lifestyle that you want to live. It's a system. I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, those are the five phases. Just as a quick recap, we've got the clean the palette phase which is building the habits, routines, and initial structure. Then move into the process phase, which is all about ticking the boxes, going through the process, and all the variable variable parts of that uh, of that part, which of that phase, which um, ultimately leads to typically the first goal of fat loss. Uh, Once you've uh, achieved your fat loss goals, you then move into the consolidation phase, which as we've spoken about today in depth is critically important which that, that then allows you to set yourself up for, for um, an investment phase. And then after, uh, after a long journey, you should end up in the, the reward phase. And, and the main takeaway from today's podcast should really be that this is a journey. There is no on and off switch. There's no end point. It's, uh, it's phasic and interchangeable, and it will move through your life as, uh, as you progress through it. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, I'm just I'm a bit emotional right now. <laughs> that is deep. <laughs> Indy should have been on this podcast. That was deep. Yeah, it's probably the first time we ever talked about that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, that's the first time we spoke about like our issues. Yeah, I, think, I don't think we've spoken about it before. So I think it hopefully it helps some people. Yeah. Um, you stay away from protein bars. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Really, I never knew they were the trigger until this weekend. I never really bought them, but now I realise that I think in the past I may have I may have had them a couple of times, and I realised that they were. This sweetness, just um, 
it's because you don't get much out of it. That's the problem. You get a couple of bites and it doesn't really satisfy anything. You don't really get, I don't know how people use it as a meal replacement in the day. This can't be anything good there. No. Two chews and a swallow, I'd call them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like, it's like, I, I, like, I really, I, I would rather you eat a chocolate bar than eat a protein bar. If your protein is covered throughout the rest of the day, like for me personally, the element of choosing a replacement food for a food that you could actually have means nothing. It's like people making protein pancakes on pancake day because they yeah. want to feel healthier than having normal pancakes. If you just use the normal strategy of buffering your calories for the day, you could have normal pancakes and not feel like you missed out on. But yeah, I, I got a couple of people that had non-negotiable protein bars every day. And I, I'm just thinking, why would you waste calories? I know there are only about 300 calories, but that's a lot. When, you, when you're only on, say you're only on 1,500 or 2,000, that's a fair amount. A that's 10, 10, 15. Yeah, it could be a quarter for some people. But it's a, it's a protein with a couple of bites. All it's going to do really is leave you with a trigger to want to eat more because it gives you that sweet taste. You've blown 300 calories. You've only got 20 grams of protein. You know, and you've just given your body a ton of crap ingredients. And it's, it's, empty, it's, it's robbed your wallet as well. Yeah, and expensive. Oh, no, fucking it's expensive. Expensive. You could buy like, I don't know, you couldn't buy Freddo's now for 10p, but you could definitely buy a twirl or something like that for a pound and and it'd be equally as good. I think it's also worth just, whilst we're here, because we're probably going to air this bit, is that protein, protein ingredients, protein content of the the bars are just uber, uber shit. Like the, the, way, the way protein is cheap, you know, really, really cheap that they put into it. The e numbers or the artificial sweeteners you know the fact is is that if you give that protein bar to a dog it will die that's that's how fucked up it is no it's disgusting yeah, they're terrible yeah um and you're just replacing it with something that you could have anyway if you manage your calories you know yeah i get it protein you know protein rules and you know getting your protein and makes you massive and stuff but you know <laughs> it it's not worth it. Just eat, eat more meats or eat more lentils or whatever, whatever diet you're choosing, in my opinion, anyway. Especially when you're on low calories. Yeah, there's just no sense. There's no satiation on a low-calorie diet. It just makes no sense. Um, but yeah, my, my experience with protein bars wasn't good and uh, I won't be getting them again. No. There's no fiber in them either, is it? Not, not good stuff anyway. Anyway. Yeah. There goes our sponsor with Grenade. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. <laughs> Never again. Definitely not getting ever the sponsor on this show. <laughs> uh, if you enjoyed today's episode with me and Nathan, and you find uh, you found value, and other people would uh, be interested in listening, please share it with your family and friends. Follow us on Instagram at rnt underscore fitness, or visit us on www.rntfitness.co.uk. Thanks for listening.